Here's the difference. In capitalism, people have risked their lives to save their dogs. In socialism, people kill their dogs to save their own lives. That's why people risk their lives to migrate to the United States of America, and that's why people risk their lives to migrate from Venezuela, North Korea, and Cuba. Welcome to Keith Knight. Don't tread on anyone. Today we have Johan Norberg, the author of Open the Story of Human Progress. He is an author, lecturer, and documentary filmmaker born in Sweden. Of course, the links to his new book will be in the description below. Mr. Norberg, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me on the show, Keith. What metrics can we use to determine whether or not humanity is in progression or decline? Well, the normal... Um yardstick we use is more or less, I think, gut feeling. Um, that's usually what people say, and they compare something that they think were the good old days sometime in the past, uh, whereas I think that that doesn't really make sense. One of the reasons why it doesn't make sense is that uh, there's this tendency in every culture and every generation to think that for some reason things have spiraled out of control right now. And it used to be better back in the, you know, the, the, my youth, at least the best music was done then. Um, there was technology that I understood. There were work relationships and family relationships that I understood. So every generation has done that thing, thought that the good old days were some 30 years back in the past. So it doesn't make sense. You can't trust your gut feeling. You have to look at objective indicators on how people are doing. And what I often do is I look at the longest time series of how are we doing when it comes to wealth, to poverty, to health, life expectancy, infant and child mortality, and, and so on. And then we can see that there's not, not a single doubt that we live in the golden era right now, uh, at least in terms of, of objective indicators of living standards. Why are some nations wealthy and some nations impoverished? Well, lots of people have thought that there's some relationship to the particular population there, the ethnicity, the religion. Uh, and But when you look at history, you can see that there are many different eras of rapid technological innovation and economic growth. Uh, all of them cut short, apart from this one yet, at least. We'll, we'll see what happens next. Um, but the thing that they have in common was that they were relatively open compared to other cultures at the same time. So what I would say, the one uh, thing that sets them apart is that they were more open to surprises than other cultures because there's there are always incumbents the powerful in politics religion the economy and they always want to block new innovations and change because it can threaten their power well those cultures that opened up a little bit at least if there were cracks in the wall that left some space for more people to come up with strange new ideas on how to do things a, a new technology to produce more or to transport in a faster way or to create something in a cheaper way and that creates makes all the difference that openness for surprises about 17 years ago you wrote I plead for greater liberty and a more open world, not because I believe one system happens to be more efficient than another, but because those things provide a setting that unleashes individual creativity as no other system can. They spur the dynamism that has led to human economic, scientific, and technical advances. At its core, belief in capitalism <clears throat> is belief in mankind. My aim is freedom and voluntary relations in all fields. Now, that you have done, uh, or I'm sorry, now that you've done a lot of research on the history and progress of mankind, what do you think about this thesis of yours from 17 years ago? Were there any shortcomings? Uh, have uh, have you doubled down and found more evidence to support it? What do you think? I think, thanks for reminding me. I think that was very well put on me, actually, back then. Uh, <laughs> and I think that point is a very important one. 
because some people think that, look, here are two economic systems. We have socialism and capitalism. Now, what's best? And that's not really how it works, because capitalism is not a system. At least free market capitalism, that's not a system. That's the opposite of a system run top down. It's the openness for people to experiment with new relationships and innovations in the economic sphere. So whenever you talk about regulating capitalism, what you really mean is that you regulate people and, and their freedom to go about things. What I would say about whether I've changed since then, I think that perhaps I had more of a Eurocentric or Western-centric perspective of the world back then, because just like so many other people, I started to study history uh, in the rearview mirror. I started with, look, it started here, in started in England with the Industrial Revolution. Why was that? Going back in history to the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, and um, Ro Romans, and then all the way back to the Greek philosophical and, and scientific revolution. Um, now, as I've studied more history, that doesn't really make sense because there's no simple trajectory like that. For example, it, in that case, you'd have to just remove 1,000 years when nothing really happened much in 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 Europe. Uh, Europe was so poor that it didn't wasn't even didn't even make sense to raid it for for nomadic bands and tribes. Um, but also, it, I lost out with all these other civilizations that made rapid progress during many eras. Uh, you have the uh, Muslim Abbasid Caliphate for a thousand years ago. You had Confucian Song China, uh, which had for its day, uh, 800 to a thousand years ago, more rule of law and more stronger property rights for farmers and stronger freedom to trade than others. And they made immense progress. They fought with gunpowder, they printed books with the um, printing press, and they navigated with a nautical compass. The three inventions that Karl Marx, writing in 18, the 1860s, said, this is typical for the European bourgeoisie. <laughs> so uh, I think I've learned more about how every civilization can come up with rapid progress as long as they have a certain degree of freedom. is you measure not necessarily dollar amount of income, but you're measuring the number of hours necessary to work in order to access products, goods, services, washer machines. So with that sort of metric in mind, why should the average person in America, Sweden, or China, or India be optimistic about global poverty? Yeah, this is a really important uh, perspective, I think, on how well we're doing. We're often making the mistakes of thinking that there's so much economic stagnation just because we don't get many more dollars and cents in our, in our paycheck. Um, but we miss out, so how long does the money go? The purchasing power, how long do we have to work to, to get something? And that's the great achievement of a functioning free market capitalism with lots of competition and innovation, that it reduces the price of everything that we need. And uh, of course, the basic ones around the world, if we're talking about reasons for being optimistic, is to make sure that people's uh, livelihood Food is uh, is cheap enough as to uh, not um, not be too expensive for uh, putting food on the table for your your kids and so on. And and when you measure extreme poverty, for example, you can see that we've because of this uh, we've made the greatest strides ever, the greatest progress against extreme poverty that the world has ever seen. We've reduced extreme poverty by around one hundred thirty thousand people every day since nineteen ninety. And it has happened the fastest in the countries that opened up the most to global trade and to individual enterprise. So, in other words, um, for the same reason we would want sort of freedom of expression in order to get out the best ideas that humanity has, you're saying we should take that and apply it to the commercial realm, to the economic sphere, just as we shouldn't be regulating who gets to marry who just uh, by the state prearranging marriages. Uh, you're saying we should take that principle and expand it to uh, commercial industries as well? Yes, that's exactly my point, that... Uh... <sighs> We shouldn't think of it too much as sort of this is this is capitalism. What it is, 
at least the free market, free trade, open version that I talk about is just economic freedom, basically. And people go about their business in any way they see fit. And we do that in various spheres. When we do that, when it comes to exploring new knowledge and debating, that's free speech. When we do that in uh, civil society and family life, that's sort of what mm, makes life really valuable to, to most of us. When we do that in the uh, political sphere, it means um, uh, in civil liberties, individual freedoms. Uh, when we do it in the economy, it's property rights, free trade, it's free market capitalism. But it's basically just the same principle. Uh, don't beat people up and don't steal their stuff. That's what it's about. Uh, so uh, could you just give us a, a quick definition of free markets, exactly what you mean by that? Because the straw man opposition would be freedom to do what? Rape, steal, commit murder, enslave others? How would you define free markets? Yeah. It means you are free to go about your business and use your own uh, legitimate resources in any way you see fit. And every transaction, therefore, has to be voluntary. That's what freedom is about, not the freedom to uh, steal and, and kill. Uh, it means the freedom to go about your own business without being interfered with by others. So basically, um, you're the, the freedom of, of my fist ends where your chin begins. That's it. Now, the Democratic Socialists have sort of gained a lot of traction, mostly by grabbing at what, as far as I see, is the moral argument. They approach things from a very moral perspective. This inequality is immoral. It is wrong for people to live in this degree of poverty. What do you think is the moral case in favor of free markets? Well, I think the moral case is that it is the first system, if we use the word system, um, which I just advised against, <laughs> but it's the first set of rules <laughs> and, uh, and rules governing behavior uh, that makes it possible for people to get rich only by enriching others. That's the whole thing. Uh, and that is really the, the moral high ground. Because every other system is built on the idea that there are those who exploit and those who are exploited. Those who decide and those who are commanded. Those who take and those who are taken from. Every system uh, from slavery to feudalism to socialism to national conservatism is based on someone deciding what everybody else should do and what their resources are meant to be used for, which means that it is more or less a zero-sum game. Uh, someone gets richer, but they do it by taking from you. What free markets is about is that no deal can ever happen without both parties thinking that they gain from it, because otherwise they wouldn't enter into it, because it's a voluntary relationship. And that's why we have in this system and this system alone, this weird form of double thanks. You know, when you go to your grocer and you buy your milk and bread and you thank him and he thanks you, because you've both done each other a service. That's the most powerful voluntary set of uh, rules that the world has ever seen. And um, so it has the moral high ground and the fact that it's also abolishing extreme poverty and chronic undernourishment uh, for the first time in history. That makes it even better. When I listen to uh, Ahmadinejad in Iran or Putin in Russia or a lot of Americans, they say that uh, America uniquely takes part in the free market system. And this is more or less an expression of the previous chattel slavery that America engaged in, where some people are trying to control the lives of others while creating disproportionate um, uh, outcomes within a system. So do you, uh, from uh, someone in Sweden, do you see uh, that there's anything philosophically valuable about the history of America? What I'm generally referring to is the Declaration of Independence. All men created equal, natural rights endowed by a creator, 
rights to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, freedom of speech, and Second Amendment uh, right to bear arms as well. Is that uh, is there anything valuable in those uh, early documents of America, or is it just national nationalist nonsense that we would have bought in if we were born in Guatemala or uh, Pakistan? No, there is something uh, deeply uh, unique and valuable in those words and those documents. And I can say that as a Swede. Uh, you know, the, the people who started the classical liberal revolution, the free market revolution in Sweden 150 years ago, um, they always talked about the American founders and how, what an inspiration they were to them, how you can start a country anew based on ideas, not on blut und boden or an ethnicity or a religion, but based on freedom and individual ownership to yourself. Lars Johan Jarta, the famous newspaper man who led the classical liberal revolution in Sweden, he had on his office wall a painting of, uh, of Turnbull, of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, because he thought that that was the most beautiful principles that you can use. So those documents are important and they are important because they ended in the longer run chattel slavery they were the words used by um, all the the heroes that fought against slavery and all the remnants of the traditional uh, world which was based on slavery and on on feudalism uh, that all men were created equal and they had the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. With those words, you couldn't uphold that inconsistency in the long run. Whereas, if you talk about Ahmadinejad and, and Putin, I mean, countries like Russia and uh, Muslim dictatorships, they've upheld uh, slavery as late as the 20th century. Uh, so they don't have that much to brag about. Now, uh, there's a number of books. Uh, one is called Against Democracy by Jason Brennan from Princeton, uh, published. The other, uh, Myth of the Rational Voter by Brian Kaplan. They gather a lot of uh, evidence that supports the uh, empirical theory that voters are not rational and they don't have a very good understanding of policies, one, or philosophy or economics or what, who their congressman is, let alone who they recently voted for. So my question to you is when you see someone like Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, let's actually take those individually. When you see someone like Bernie Sanders go from like zero in 1970 to today, almost getting the presidential nomination for the biggest party, uh, what do you think really drags people into the Bernie Sanders uh, idea or view of the world? Well, I think that he, he's he got the best ideas if you don't understand economics. <laughs> because he's he's offering you all those free that free stuff. So obviously, why wouldn't you want that? Uh, it, it sounds great. It's like a wish list. Uh, so... And if you don't understand that resources have to be created and they have to be created through a process of innovation and of exchange constantly and that the policies that he is uh, would implement would ruin many of those opportunities. Well, in that case, I understand why he's popular. And I do think and I hate to sound uh, too um, um, derogatory here, but, you know, some students and I've been a student myself, uh, we, when you haven't started working yet and you just get this, um, you live on your parents' expense and on uh, student debt and so on, it's so easy to just think, why couldn't I just get some more? It, it makes a lot, it, it's understandable in that case to start to dream about, yeah, why don't we have politicians who just take from some and give it to me? Now, what about... Uh what do you think drives uh, attractiveness to Donald Trump? This was a guy who in South Carolina, while debating Jeb Bush, the you know relative of two former U.S. presidents, said, Jeb, your brother lied. He got us into a war. Iraq was based on a lie. You should be ashamed. And this guy wins the Republican nomination and four years later gets an increase of, I think, like eight or nine million votes, something incredible. So if we can rule out rationality and a good understanding of history, philosophy, and economics as being the reason for support, what do you think really drives support for someone like Donald Trump? 
Yeah, no, I think we have that hypothesis has left the station a long time ago, that it's based on some sort of rational calculation. Uh, I think that you, you referred to Brian Kaplan's book, The Myth of the Rational Voter. Uh, one of the things that Kaplan points out is that two, there are two areas where the opinions of informed scholars, and specifically economists, Kaplan is an economist, uh, diverge the most from the average voter, is trade and migration because those are few of the areas where there's almost a consensus among economists that trade and migration benefits us because it creates bigger markets, more specialization, more opportunities and more more wealth. Um, but to most people, trade and migration seems like uh, someone else is going to benefit from this. And I think that this relates to my book, um, Open. Because, you know, I think that we, all of us, have this tendency to see the world and the economy as a zero-sum game. We think that if a migrant benefits, we lose. If China benefits from trade, we lose out. Someone's got to lose out, right? And I think that's because in our prehistory, for such a long time, we didn't have economic growth. We didn't have innovation on a large scale so that we saw that our lives improved uh, or most people's lives improved at the same time. So if someone else was very successful, it was probably because they had stolen it from me. So it made sense to be suspicious about the rich or the migrants, the other tribe. And that's part of our human nature, I think, that suspicion, the suspicion of those who import goods to us or across the border and make a living here. There's something wrong with that. So I think that sentiment, uh, and, and I mean, Trump doesn't have many consistent policies, but his opposition to free trade and to migration has, been, I guess, been closest to some sort of consistency. And uh, yeah, lots of people, unfortunately, like that. Let's say I am not interested in the history of how we got here. Long story short, there's a ton of wealth, and I just want it redistributed because I see poor people and I see rich people. And what the heck are we sitting around for just reading books and talking about policies? This needs to be redistributed regardless of how we previously got here. What do you have to say to the mindset that the one thing stopping wealth from being acquired and distributed is a policy that simply takes from one group and gives to another? I would say if someone really doesn't care about that, I would say that's just trivial. If you really want to improve people's lives, it doesn't make sense to just take the wealth that seems to be there somewhere because, you know, it's not there somewhere. It's not like we have big piles of, of wealth in a sort of Scrooge McDuck uh, vault or anything like that. Wealth is being created every minute in offices, on computers, in factories, when we combine old stuff in new exciting ways. And sure, if you want, you can take some of that and give a little bit more to a particular group. Um, but it's trivial compared to the wealth that is being created if we leave those processes alone. If you have 2% per capita growth in an economy, it means that everything doubles in around 35 years. So in 35 years, we'll all be more or less on average twice as well off. That's bigger, that's more important. And if we could through, for example, lower taxes, less regulation, more open trade and, and so on, if we could increase it to 3% per capita per year, then we reduce that time of doubling the size of the economy to around 23 years. That's what makes a major difference in every human being's life, rather than getting a little bit more this year compared to last year. Now, a competing uh, theory of history uh, in opposition to your new book, Open, the Story of Human Progress, is history shows free markets... <coughs> are a Koch brothers euphemism for the strong exploiting the weak. Progress is the result of state intervention, people working through the mechanism of the state to achieve their desires. The New Deal, financial regulations, redistributive taxation, a welfare safety net to avoid starvation, labor laws protecting 
the vulnerable from the strong minimum wage laws, making sure that we all at least get some earnings when we uh, perform labor, and antitrust to stop monopolies from virtually enslaving the masses. How does your view of history differ from this one? <laughs> Who was that? Because that was a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> that 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 is me trying to ah. uh, summarize the uh, narrative that I previously believed when I was an Obama supporter. Right. Okay. Well, yeah. No, but it was a, a nice summary of, of uh, that kind of argument. Well, it's based on the mistaken interpretation that all the things when when governments walk after. The wealth creators, basically, uh, entrepreneurs, innovators, and, and workers, and redistribute some here and put something over there. They think that they've done it all, basically. But had you done that in 1850, redistributed everything on our planet, we would all have a an average income level at around Tanzania's uh, level today. So it's not the case that you can redistribute yourself to wealth. That's like sort of lifting yourself in, in your hair. You have to build it from the bottom up. You have to create uh, that wealth constantly. If we did it now, uh, we'd all live on around, I think it's Mexico's level of, of income. If we really want to make uh, a, a difference long term for people, then we have to create more wealth. That's more ideas and, and more innovation. Um, so that's part of it. But the other part of it uh, in relationship to this is that some of these restrictions and controls, they create real problems for those who are engaged in trying to create wealth every day and come up with the new solutions. And uh, the kind, one of the biggest difficulties there are is that we have this massive regulation of any kind of new processes and technologies that uh, we use, which it means it's not just enough to do all the research and fight with difficult um, uh, funders and to find a market for, for it all and try to get it up to scale. But you also have to fight bureaucrats on this. And then if you implement things like, um, say, minimum wages as well, you're not helping anyone. You're just pricing some people out of the market. It's a way of banning people who are too who have too little productivity so far um, to to get a job, which which is really quite bad. Because what we need most of all is to get to that ladder, the first uh, stepping stone before you can uh, move onwards. And that's really what it means. People don't live on minimum wages all their life. I think the uh, latest study I saw in the U.S. was that. Over 63 p uh, th over 63 percent of people who are hired on a minimum wage, they are promoted by the year's end. So it's a way of just getting onto that first stepping stone so that you can move on. We have so many examples. We have certificate of need laws, which literally are there in about half of the states of America, where you need the permission of potential competitors in order for you to open up a hospital. No wonder the prices are so high. You have Jay Austin, a guy who was building houses for about $1,000 in Washington, D.C., uh, and uh, that was made illegal by uh, the state. You can watch my video, The Number One Cause of Homelessness. Elvis Summers tried building houses in California for a thousand dollars, and the state said these are not up to regulations. We're going to uh, confiscate these, and don't worry because we're actually going to be implementing a poverty program in a couple years. So they stole the houses <laughs> that were on private property and uh, and confiscated them because they didn't meet uh, state regulations. You have so many examples of that. Wow. Um, yeah. uh, now let's say yeah, and I'm, don't get me no, started on license requirements, which are really exactly the same uh, thing protecting the incumbents and protecting the less efficient uh, profiteers from any kind of competition. And it's really a mess if uh, for people to to uh, pick up their sticks and, and move to another state and start a new career if they have lost their job because they might have to do it all again. Well, it's incredible. There was like this two month debate on whether or not you should have to have a license to vote, a driver's license, which is a bit of a pain. It takes about a day. 
You know how many licenses you have to go through to open up a business? Yeah, that restricts even more people from, you know, uh, entering into the market, giving us more options as consumers, more options as employees. So it's like they see restriction in the voting realm limits votes. Restrictions in the business realm, well, that's just the only way that we can possibly advance. You know, it's the, the, totally, totally inconsistent. Now, let's say that I look at your book, open the story of human progress and i see that you clearly have displayed a correlation between the more open a society is the more progress that exists more wealth more literacy more education more freedom and voluntary exchanges however this is not because of capitalism but in spite of it so correlation not necessarily equaling causation how do we know that the success that these societies experience is as a causal result of free market capitalism not kind virtuous state intervention yes that's a good question and what we have to do is then to look at it from different angles so one of them is that we can simply see look at uh, correlation looking at uh, statistical uh, correlations we can do modeling economic modeling trying to find uh, if there are other variables that are relevant in to this extent but this is also why i think that we need some more uh, sensitivity to uh, the humanities to history and to uh, sociology and to look at how do people change their behaviors as they get more or less freedom and uh, that's it gets more complicated because it's not as easy to put it into a model or a simple statistical um, uh, model uh, instead you have to look at um, people you have to look at uh, stories you have to uh, look at before and after effects uh, and if you combine that, uh, if you combine those different uh, versions, that's as close as we get, I'd say, to um, to find things like that. There are a few natural experiments in politics and in uh, economics, but there are some. <laughs> there are almost uh, natural experiments where countries that have the same kind of population with the same kind of history, the same language, the same um location uh, they've been split in two with one group getting more freedom and more free markets the other one getting um much less we have we had east and west germany we had uh, we had south and north korea we had china and taiwan and in all those instances we saw that um east germany despite the fact that it was probably the most developed uh, part of um of the communist bloc and having been richer than western europe originally uh, was so rusted and destroyed by socialism that um, west germany is still paying off its debt after the reunification in north and south korea we see sort of the, the fastest growth rate the world has ever seen basically with south korea whereas we've seen the greatest misery we've seen in the modern era in north korea in in china before they began to open up in the 1980s a um some of the greatest hunger disasters uh, the world has ever uh, seen and dramatic stagnation whereas taiwan was one of the poor countries that proved that they could make an entrance into the first world and then china started to learn from Taiwan and from Hong Kong and uh, began to implement some of those policies and then they got the fastest growth rates instead. So um, there are almost natural experiments like that and it's difficult I think for anyone to, uh, uh, to, to have another interpretation of those examples. Another competing uh, theory of history in opposition to your uh, book open the story of human progress is nations do not become wealthy because you know embracing free markets or anything it's major things like natural resources imperialism and slavery cheap labor slavery imperialism and natural resources how do you respond to that theory of wealthy nations uh yeah to start with slavery and imperialism one problem is that uh, all countries have you had slavery 
and all have tried to engage in imperialism. It's just that many failed and, and a few uh, worked. There's a somewhat, um, a, uh, it seems superficially likely that there's a relationship between uh, imperialism and uh, economic growth, but that's correlation and not causation. It's basically the other way around grew richer and developed better technologies, they were unfortunately more successful in subjugating other peoples. So that, for example, Britain could create an empire where the sun never set because they had the Industrial Revolution. But they had the Industrial Revolution first before they built this enormous empire. And when you look at it economically, the empire was a drag on resources. We don't think so because lots of people made big money because they could steal and kill and and take resources from others but the cost to britain and to british taxpayers were immense to have this enormous navy and the military sent out all over the world to engage in all those crimes to protect a little tiny group so uh, the the economists who have looked at that, that are pointing out that they would have been much more successful without that that empire. Uh, when it comes to resources, I think that uh, the, the only example that we really need uh, the most resource con uh, rich continent is Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, uh, the the resource poorest countries are places like uh, Switzerland and uh, Hong Kong and. Singapore and uh, well, Japan doesn't have that much either. So it seems to be that, again, we make this mistake. We see resources, countries sell them, they make lots of money on those resources. What we don't see is uh, what's happening in the rest of the economy, their failure of diversifying because of this, and often distorting the political incentives in places. We've, and we've definitely seen this in, in Africa, where it has created incentives for all groups to fight over political control. So it basically just create a struggle, often with military means, uh, but to, to get the capital and to function as basically an occupying force and just extracting resources and then destroying the opportunities that would come with property rights, with freedom of association and trade. Now, in response to uh, maybe more or less accepting this overall thesis, one might say, all right, fine, we have more houses, TVs, computers, and iPhones, congratulations. But this is coming at the expense of the environment, of the plants, of the future human societies that could exist. It's coming at the expense of our oceans, which we are trashing along with our landfills. Therefore, free markets are immoral because they incentivize productivity, which comes at the expense of the environment. Therefore, your thesis is illegitimate and something we should reject. How do you respond to that? Yes, I have, have some sympathy for that, being an old environmentalist myself. Um, but the problem is to confuse uh, wealth creation with resource destruction, and uh, specifically that the, the free market uh, is, is doing it. If that were the case, what about the communist countries? What about the Soviet Union? W wouldn't they be the greenest um, places on, on the planet? On the contrary, uh, two Soviet economists found out in the 1980s that the Soviet factories used around twice as much resources to produce the same kind of output as American and Western factories did, and, and much more energy to do it. And why was that? Because they had a command economy. If they produced something that the government thought was important, that the Politburo thought was important, they got all the resources and all the power that they needed to do it. So they didn't care if that ruined the planet. Whereas in a free market economy, you all the resources are costly and you work hard constantly to reduce your consumption of, of resources. And therefore you, you reduce your environmental footprint in, uh, to, to that extent. And it's, it's, that's partly it. That kind of competition is, is incredibly important. It's also that wealth in itself, itself creates 
new opportunities and new technologies and widens our, our uh, scientific knowledge and our technology to go green in, in many ways. And people are surprised when I say this, but when you look at the six great pollutants, the ones that hurt people's lungs, destroy the forests and the rivers, in Europe and in the United States, they've been reduced by around 70% since the 1980s because we got all these scrubbers and filters and adsorbers and, and lots of stuff. A car today apparently emits less pollution when it's driving at full speed than a parked car did in 1970 because of the leaks from that car. So it tells you something about what we're able to do with more knowledge and with more wealth. Yeah, more freedom and innovation. Got three more questions for you, sir. I want to thank you so much for your time. A lot sure. of criticism of the free market, you'll hear things like, well, there's corruption and there's greed and people don't have a lot of information, so they often get manipulated. The problem with virtually all of these criticisms is they apply tenfold to government intervention because you can't opt out of it and they don't face competitors to which you can go to if you're not satisfied with the product or service. Do you see that there's any uh, unique criticism of the free market that doesn't also apply to socialism or the state? No, what would that be? And I mean, the, the corruption thing, definitely. I mean, if you have to go to 11 bureaucrats to start a business or get your permit or your license requirement. That's 11 bureaucrats who can force you to pay bribes to do it. And that's one of the biggest problems in many poor countries. You know, when I go, uh, when I've been to Kenya, uh, people tell me in the slums that they have a saying that it's not safe to carry cash around here because there are too many policemen. <laughs> and the policemen, they see, oh, you got a store here. Would be sad if something happened to that, eh? You don't have a permit, right? So just pay up. So the fewer restrictions and regulations, the fewer opportunities for, for corruption. Well, is there anything unique you can say about the problems of free markets that doesn't apply to it? They would have to be more, I think, psychological. It would have to be something about, are we overwhelmed with choice? Uh, perhaps we don't want as much freedom as we have in a uh, more open economy. Perhaps it's better if someone tells us what to do. And I think there are some uh, intellectuals who are trying to make, make that argument. Well, we have Cass Sunstein, who wrote the book Nudge, who says, yeah, uh, unfortunately, people have too much choice and it's the role of the state to uh, coerce them into doing otherwise. So unfortunately, that uh, is one. But for the same reason, I oppose the state forcibly stopping me. I also oppose Walmart from stopping me and Amazon. So I just hold them to the same standard I'd hold anyone else. Yeah, choice is bad, but it doesn't give me the right to go around violently dominating Johan Norberg. I'm going to need to see a copy of the book before I allow <laughs> it to be published because you have too many choices with what you want to write about so uh that, that yeah, that's it's always answer. the other guy's choices that's a problem right it's never <laughs> yeah. your own that has to be restricted that's... of course two more uh questions for you they're more or less the same what is the most important thing you learned from the works of adam smith i still learn so many things from Adam Smith, I'd have to say. So uh, I'm not done with him yet. Um, and often when I think that he's made a mistake, I have to go back and I realize that, no, I, I made a mistake there. I think that his most important insight, and this is something that I'm still to get my head wrapped around, it's, you know, his whole idea about the... Uh, it's not from the benevolence of your butcher that you expect meat but from his self-interest. And it's almost like they're all, we're all guided by an invisible hand to produce opportunities for others as well because we benefit from it. I think the key message there is to understand that this is not about economics. This is a worldview. This is a view on man, on human beings and what they are about. Because before Adam Smith, Everybody had the idea that we are each other's enemies. If we are let loose, if we have freedom, we'll go crazy. We'll destroy one another and we'll hurt one another and we'll try to enrich ourselves by stealing and killing. 
Um, Adam Smith's fabulous insight that we still have to learn at a fundamental level, I think, is that we are not each other's enemies. If we make sure that we have institutions that explains what's mine and what's yours, and that every transaction has to be voluntary, then your success is a gift to me. The other group or the other country or the other family, if they have get more knowledge, more technology, produce more wealth, that's an opportunity for me. It makes my life better. And that's the insight that was so important, not specifically in just launching the modern era of economic growth, though that's important too, but it's changed the perspective and taught people that other groups are not our opponents and our enemies. It's not that we have to hold them down because they belong to a religious minority or because they are women or because they are slaves or something like that, but give people equal freedom and then their success will be your success as well. That's an incredibly profound and important insight. Final question, what is the most important thing you learned from the works of Milton Friedman? Well, again, lots of, of stuff. I think that his most intuitive and, and fun uh, insight is this, his four ways of spending money. Uh, <laughs> you, you've heard it, right? Um, you can spend your own money or you can spend somebody else's money. And you can spend them on yourself or on somebody else. Those are, those four capture it all basically. And his insight is just how does this change your perspective based on where you are in this matrix? Because if you spend your own money on yourself, well, you don't want to spend too much. You're economical and, and you're sort of, you don't want to waste money. Uh, and you think very hard about what to get if you're buying sort of new clothes or a new computer. If you spend your own money on somebody else, for example, if you're buying a gift, you're still concerned about how much it costs. You think about sort of, yeah, how much can I buy him for birth, for the birthday gift? And then you go out to look for it and you do some work, but not too much because there is a limited time uh, on the planet uh, for you. Um, but then you can spend somebody else's money on yourself for example, on an executive lunch, and then you make sure that you go to a really fancy place and that it costs lots and that you get lots of value for your boss's uh, money. And then there's the fourth. You spend somebody else's money on somebody else. And that's basically everything that the government does. You don't care about how much you spend and you don't really care if it ends up in the right place. That's obviously not exactly the way it works. Some work very hard about and think about how uh, to make sure that they make an important difference, but they have limited knowledge because it's not themselves. They don't know where these money will be spent in the best uh, way. So the further away you get from spending your own money on what you know, really know about, the more you will waste uh, resources and the worse the gifts will will end up being mr norberg thank you so much for your time the book is open the story of human progress the link will be in the description below mr norberg thank you so much for your time and your excellent contributions to uh, the uh, fields of uh, free markets and philosophy and economics thank you very much this was a pleasure